I'm on the identity and network access team. I work as part of our customer success architecture team. Uh, and I work a lot with developers on how to best build and optimize for our platform. And uh, with me today is Harish. Harish, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Kyle. Hi, I'm a program manager in the Microsoft Identity division, where I work with a lot of developers and help them integrate their applications with our identity platform and make sure they follow the best practices and keep the application secure. So that's that. And off to you, Kyle. Thanks for that. Thanks. So we're we're doing a quick refresher on resiliency and 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 building your application so that they can be uh, more resilient and uh, uh, for uh, any any protect, potential issues between you uh, and getting your tokens. So we're doing going to do a quick recap of some general guidance uh, that we have from our resiliency for developers white paper. Uh, another quick look at uh, authorization in general and specifically. Uh, a continuous access evaluation, which is our newest feature, which does add a lot of resiliency, but we're going to talk about some other uh, things to keep in mind with continuous access evaluation today. Uh, and then Harish is going to dive into some of our newer guidance around uh, signature token token validation and signature uh, key, uh, signing key metadata, et cetera. So just to recap where we have have been for our guidance for uh, for developers with respect to building more resilient applications. Uh, let's first start with applications that sign in users. So whenever a user is present in front of the application, frankly, our easiest advice is that you should, wherever possible, build on top of the Microsoft authentication libraries or MSOL. These libraries are available in a number of different developer environments. Uh, and they really do encapsulate not only our best practices, if you will, but lots of optimizations uh, to work very well with Microsoft Identity. So yes, they're built on top of open standards like uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2, uh, but we do, uh, since we are the implementers of the service, know how to make some additional optimizations. So yes, we wanna make it very easy for your applications to integrate um, so we handle a lot of the kind of work that lots of uh, protocol level libraries uh, need you to do. So we look after managing uh, the tokens, caching them. Uh, we can help you with how you can persist them uh, and all of that work. We, we go ahead and make it easy for you to not have to worry or spend any time uh, implementing that capability in your applications. But where we can go beyond things like best practices uh, is this in the concept, uh, concept, for example, of proactive token refresh that we'll talk about uh, when we would get to a continuous access evaluation. Or uh, also today, uh, we are building in, we have a resiliency capability in built into Azure AD today, uh, where we have a, a decorrelated uh, backup system uh, that can issue tokens uh, with our primary system being completely down. Um, and while we can do automatic switchovers from one to the other, if the part of our infrastructure that, that does that automatic switch is down, MSOL can fall back and do the automatic switch auto, uh, for, for you. Uh, so these are the kinds of things we can build into our libraries because they're, they're infinitely familiar with our infrastructure. Um, if you're not uh, building on top of MSOL, there are some general guidance. First off, caching tokens is really important. Uh, it's important just in terms of performance so that we don't uh, go ahead and start throttling your application, but really it reduces your dependency on getting a token in the first place. If I ask for a token every minute when I actually have a token that's good for an hour or a lot longer than an hour, I'm simply putting an unnecessary burden on my application to make sure that, oh, that, 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 that infrastructure has to be up, that the network has to be up, everything between me and getting that token has to be up and running, uh, when I really didn't need it because a cash token uh, takes care of me having to make a lot of extra calls. Now, it's also important that you serialize and persist these tokens. Now, this has to be done very securely, but we give you access tokens today. Uh, generally, they might be good for about an hour or so, uh, uh, we're looking at everything we can to extend those token lifespans. Continuous access evaluation is an example of this. Now we'll have tokens, access tokens, good for a day. Uh, we have refresh tokens that are good for many days. Well, if I can drive my authentication because I don't need it because I already have a perfectly good access token, 
or I can drive it with a refresh token, that takes out a whole chunk of infrastructure that my application doesn't have to worry about right now. So if I have to do a fresh authentication where the user has to type in their username and password maybe, or do an MFA or password list, I take on a dependency into all kinds of subsystems of Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory is a, is a large service with, made up of many, many different components. Well, not all of the components may necessarily need to be uh, online or offline in order to impact your resilience to the application. For example, uh, if I'm doing a fresh authentication now and that requires an MFA, now I'm required on the, the mobile device, the, the, the network carrier, the cell phone carrier, if you will. I'm the, re the reliant on the device of the, of, of the MFA device and so on. Whereas if I can just pick up a refresh token that I have for, that's good for uh, a week, then I don't need to do that fresh authentication and all the dependency on that infrastructure uh, isn't, isn't required right now. And that's really the key here is we want to make sure that whenever possible, you follow the, our prescribed guidance of always asking for acquiring a token silently to begin with. We want to avoid these fresh authentications. So for example, in your code, you should never be saying prompt equals login or prompt equals consent because first off, it's a bad experience. It requires the user to make a gesture now that they didn't need, really need to do because we had a perfectly good single sign-on state to work with. But on top of that, it's also taking these dependencies on those subsystems that I was saying before. Now I have to make sure that the MFA infrastructure is also running end to end. And that might be simple as simply as, you know, does their phone still have battery power? All right, so all of these things come into play uh, if uh, if I if I require uh, these fresh authentications and don't do silent token authentication with uh, cache tokens and refresh tokens, etc. Again, MSOL handles all of that. If you wanted to do, uh, if, if if you're using MSOL, whenever we respond with a with a, an error code, uh, response code, something like a 429 especially or a 500 response code, you need to honor our uh, retry after that we give you back as this is how long you should wait before you ask us again. It's really, really problematic for the, the resiliency overall. If we turn around and say, hey, we, we need you to, to honor our, uh, our 429 and, and, and don't come back uh, for a while, if the application start immediately hitting the, sy the system uh, in tight loops right after that, uh, it can actually hurt overall uh, uh, resiliency of the system. Um, so we really do need developers to pay attention to that retry after we give you uh, when, when we give you one of these response codes. If we don't provide that retry after uh, code, then you need to go ahead in your application and have a e exponential backup, uh, back off rather, as a backup uh, to not get, getting the retry after. So again, the really important thing here is to not Joe, go into a tight loop trying your retries uh, because that could adversely affect the overall performance of the system altogether. Now, whenever possible, you should use brokered authentication. Brokered authentication is us using uh, on our, all of all of the devices today. We have on on mobile devices, uh, on iOS, it could be the the uh, or it is rather the Authenticator app. On Android, it could be the Authenticator app or the company portal. Uh, we're just entering preview uh, to be able to have uh, the company portal app on Mac OS handle this capability. And on Windows, it's built in uh, into the Windows OS with something called the Web Account Manager. The, all of this does is it can work with something we refer to as a primary refresh token. We can issue primary refresh tokens to first party Microsoft apps like the operating system or these brokers. And that allows us to share more state across applications. Uh, not needing to do, for example, an additional MFA or sharing that that state across uh, all of the applications that go through the broker. So it can it can really help your re your resilience uh, by using our brokered authentication. And this now is our primary guidance even for Windows, uh, with the uh, introduction of the capability of the MSOL library .NET library, our desktop one, uh, to use the web uh, web account manager uh, for its authentication. This is our primary guidance now. Uh, for this, it also, by the way, makes it possible uh, to know if the device is managed and to, and to support a number of other uh, conditional access policies uh, that can really help secure your enterprise as well.
Now, if your application doesn't have users in front of it, you're a service or a daemon, uh, something along those lines, um, we first and foremost think that you should be using, whenever possible, uh, a managed identity for Azure resources. So if you're building these services on Azure, you should be using an Azure uh, a managed identity for Azure resource. Uh, the first thing is they are more secure because there's no need for secrets management. If you can't manage a secret, you can't lose it. You can't have it stolen. You can't have it incorrectly used in some other way, shape, or form. Uh, so this is a, a really big improvement to the security. But it also means that we can also uh, use additional optimizations since we uh, handle the code for both ends of the managed identity. Uh, we can do things, for example, like the long-lived tokens and proactively refresh them. Uh, and we can also, given the fact that we know that this service is running from a particular Azure region, uh, we can turn around and uh, localize to that region with respect to the interactions with the identity and any Azure AD that, that's required as well. So that helps us stay uh, and not take a dependency on another data center or another region. If your service is running from one region, we won't bring in a dependency on a second region because we're using a generic uh, authentication. Uh, we know where the, the, the region of your code is running and therefore we can go ahead uh, and, and optimize for that, for that regionality as well. And then finally, we do have a section of our uh, MSOL libraries that is targeted specifically uh, at, uh, at helping the confidential client or daemon applications. Uh, we have a confidential client object there, uh, and it, again, knows how to work with tokens. It knows how to uh, do this, uh, to, to, to refresh them, et cetera. Uh, the proactive token refresh comes into play, and uh, we also can, can work with the gateway when it's, uh, if the gateway is down. So using MSOL uh, for your daemon or service applications can also help with the resiliency you have now. Let's talk about authorization. Um, so to begin with, there's a, a couple of phases that we're going to look at for authorization here. Let's, let's uh, do a quick refresher. When we do authorization for an API today, uh, so for example, the Microsoft Graph API, the way that Azure uh, Active Directory does this or Microsoft Identities do this uh, is through providing to the, application, to the application something called an access token that the application then turns around and provides directly to the, the API or the resource uh, that the application needs to access. Now this application, this API rather, doesn't know really where this token came from. All it knows is it came from the, the, the client that's calling the API. It needs to check to find out, you know, what, if this token is actually been issued by the authority, Azure AD in this case, uh, that they can trust. Now, we don't have to validate this token by calling back to Microsoft Identity and say, is this token good? Is this token good? Instead, uh, the application, the API, needs to go to our endpoint, our well-known endpoint, uh, and uh, go from there and get the signing keys, the keys which we have published that we are using to sign these tokens. So the token is going to be signed. We're going to make sure that it's it's properly signed. And then once we, we look that it's signed, we can then say, oh, is this a token that, that Microsoft Identity says it's using? So this is not a call that you make on every, every call that every time somebody calls your API, you don't turn around and call us. Uh, you use this, this metadata, the signing keys, uh, token, uh, public keys uh, on a, on a, infrequent basis, uh, on a regular basis rather, but, but uh, infrequently, not for every API call. So the thing is that token is actually valid, uh, therefore, until it expires. So we issue a token uh, by, 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 we usually issue a token for say an hour, uh, and that token is good and can be used for that entire hour as far as the API is concerned. Now this creates a problem because what if an event happens after the token issues, but before the hour expires. Well, we don't have an opportunity to, uh, 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 by default, uh, to do anything about that token. It simply has to expire. Well, with one option that some identity providers do is instead of providing a token that is a JWT token that can be validated just uh, on the API side without calling the identity provider, they suggest that the API for every API call needs to call back to the identity provider 
uh, and see if that token is still valid. It does allow them to uh, to to uh, invalidate the token or revoke the token quickly, but it also means every time somebody calls your API, another API call needs to be made. So this is a very expensive process because it will slow down uh, the responsiveness of your APIs uh, on top of just causing a, a lot of overhead in, in adding these uh, these extra calls. So we uh, at uh, Microsoft Identity uh, aren't going to adopt a introspection model. Uh, instead, what we are doing is working with um, working uh, to, to create, create something we're calling Microsoft Continuous Access Evaluation. We're doing this in consultation with the uh, the OpenID Connects Shared Signals and Events Working Group. So we're we're quite keen on aligning our efforts. Uh, but we're implementing this before the standard is done, if you will. So we can today have Microsoft Continuous Access Evaluation. And what happens there is, before I even have an application in the picture, a relationship is established, a conversation, if you will, is established between the API, in this case, Microsoft Graph, uh, and uh, Microsoft Identity. So now Microsoft Identity has the ability to push events to the to the resource in, uh, in here, Microsoft Graph API. So we can tell the resource, hey, there's a security event for a user that you need to be aware of. Or we can say, oh, well, this user has a conditional access policy that includes their location. Uh, so when the user uh, uh, accesses the API, uh, keep an eye out for the location changes. So by doing that, uh, we now have a direct connection uh, that that uh, transcends what, what token, what particular token we've issued. Now the application comes along as always. It, it provides an access token to the uh, to the API, but now the API can say, "Hey, has has this token been revoked? Should I really accept this token still? Um, or you know, ha is this this uh, user have a conditional access policy that includes location, and therefore I should check the user's location or the location that this a the API was called from right before I go ahead and and continue?" Uh, so I do see we have a question. Uh, you say an access token usually expires about an hour. What can change the expiration time? Is it more someone could revoke, uh, but the longest lifetime is one hour? Uh, no, there's a number of different factors that could change the token's lifespan. There, There is an ability to customize the, the life of a token, uh, which is something we don't normally suggest because it's better to make things happen automatically. Um, but uh, for example, we're starting to issue our tokens uh, around about an hour. Um, so we uh, will we'll issue a token lifespan somewhere between uh, 60 and 90 minutes. So in average, about 75 minutes. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, you know, we find situations where we, uh, you know, a company shows up and everybody signs in at nine o'clock. Uh, well, now everybody's refreshing their tokens every hour and it kind of puts the strains on everybody's infrastructure. So we're adding some jitter, if you will, to the length of token lifespan, so that not all of the tokens are are, are expiring at the same moment and, and need to be authenticated at the same moment. Um, so that's one area, and then we're going to talk about another that could really uh, extend the token lifespan. So a developer really know never knows how long the token is going to good, be good for until we tell you how long it's good for. So, but with continuous access evaluation, now the uh, the the API can look at these other factors: have we revoked the token or not? And for example, say we have had a uh, an event happen: the user changed their password, uh, they lost their device, so we revoke those those sessions. Um, and uh, the API can now turn around and say, well, uh, we're not going to accept your token. Uh, we're going to return an unauthorized uh, response code because your token no longer authorizes you to access this API. And we'll re include this www-authenticate uh, header uh, in, in which we will provide something we refer to as a claims challenge. The claims challenge is simply the details uh, uh, that, uh, that is, uh, it, first off, it identifies itself that is a particular error. It comes from uh, Microsoft Identity, obviously. Uh, it says we have an insufficient claim. Uh, in this case, for example, the claim may be that ins insufficient is it needed to be issued after noon, after one o'clock, let's say, because at 1230, the user lost their device and we revoked all their sessions. 
So we need a token that's issued after one, or we need it. Uh, we need to check your location or the user's password change. Um, but your claims in the token you have at the moment are insufficient because they were issued. It was issued too early, for example. So the the uh, I have my uh, the, the the error comes from Azure AD. It's insufficient claims, and if I look at something like a claims challenge, I the, decoded. Here we see that the challenge is the claim that you have, you're not before, is not after the value I actually need, which is the, the new time upon which the token has to be issued for. I see we have another uh, question, conditional access sessions control refresh and session tokens, like, um, token lifespan policy access tokens. Yes, we can. Yeah, there are other ways that will affect those lifespans. Uh, that's true. So, for example, if, if I have a, a sign-in uh, required, a sign-in frequency required, that could impact the token life uh, as well. So, um, so once I get my claims challenge, the application is going to turn around and provide that claims challenge back to Azure Active Directory in order to get a token that meets those sufficient claims. So we'll handle events today, things like the users. Uh, obviously, if the if the account is disabled or deleted. Uh, if their password changes, any of these areas will cause us to send a message to the API. So Azure AD would say, oh, look, the users changed their password. We'll go and inform the Microsoft Graph API that they now need to, to issue a claims challenge because uh, with the new password, we want to, the, the, the user to put the new password on that other device. Um, Oh, so uh, that, that's uh, so we are talking a bit about how we're going to uh, make the app more resilient to an Azure AD outage. Conditional access evaluation is one big area here. Um, so we can generate this conditional access evaluation uh, event based on you know the user, something happened to the user, or the API itself can check and say, oh, the user has a, a conditional access policy that requires location. Uh, you need the user the, uh, to re access this resource. The user has to be on CorpNet, for example, or some location-based policy. And if the API call comes from a different policy, then we can simply go ahead and, and, and fail that call. So conditional access uh, evaluation really does help security uh, a lot. Let me just do a quick demo here. Uh, so I've signed in a couple of applications already. So this application, as you see, is uh, using continuous access evaluation. Uh, and if I look at my token response, the token is good for uh, until just before 9 o'clock when I signed in uh, later today, uh, on the uh, uh, June the 18th. I also have another instance of this application running. This instance is not using continuous access evaluation. So you see the check mark is unset. And if I look at my token lifespan here, uh, I see that the token is good until 10 o'clock, so about an hour after I signed in, uh, but today, not tomorrow. So I'm sorry, today's the 17th. This token is good for an hour until 10 o'clock. Uh, this token, which was signed in about the same time, is good for a day. So one thing here is I don't need to go back to Azure AD and ask for a token again uh, until this day expires. Right, so now I've increased my resiliency to an Azure AD outage because I'm not going to ask for tokens anymore, or as often anymore. So let's go over here and see what happens if I go to my uh, my tenant portal for for this user, and I'm just going to go ahead and revoke sessions for the user. Now this does require participation by the developer. What I have to have in my application. Let me bring that over for us. Here we are. So uh, I have to have, so when I make an API call, a, a REST API call, um, what I need to do, I don't need to worry about a successful status code, but if my application gets a 401, I need to check for my WW Authenticate header. If the header is there, I make sure that the error of insufficient claims is there as well. And if that's true, I can grab the claims challenge, decode it, and then I can simply go ahead and call for getting at my, my MSAW, getting an access token, but now I'm going to include my claims challenge as part of that request. So I acquire a token silently. So maybe the, uh, the user can, can authenticate, go through this process without a silently. So for example, if we 
uh, just change locations and they change back, we could acquire the token silently. Uh, but uh, mo if I revoke the sessions, that's going to require a full authentication. So I'll fall back to acquire token interactive. And again, I'll provide that claims challenge when I make that call. As long as I have this code in my application, then I can go ahead and when I create my MSOL client, I can add the client capability of CP1, which is really telling Azure Active Directory and the API that your application understands uh, and has implemented uh, continuous access evaluation. So now if I go back to my applications, let's get these out of the way. Um, if I go profile here, I can keep calling my profile API. It's, everything's working fine. If I come over to uh, the, the access, the continuous access evaluation one, sure enough, I hit my breakpoint. I'm getting a claims challenge back. And now in order to use this application, the user actually has to authenticate again I have to go through authentication. It's a fresh authentication, so it is going to require me to actually enter my password, uh, and it is going to require me to uh, do my MFA because this user is configured for that. So all of that has to happen because uh, we were able to deny access or, or, or stop block access uh, to the resource because of that uh, event. But if I keep going here, you'll notice on the app that's not using continuous access evaluation, it's still working and it's going to work until uh, 10 o'clock when this user is actually going to have to sign in again. So that is an example of why we're a lot more secure. One of the real details here is when we get into using continuous access evaluation, we can issue these tokens for up to 20, 20, 28 hours. So we start the, we saw, just saw a token that was issued for 12 hours. So now, as long as everything's fine, I don't have to go back and make another call to Azure AD without uh, and before that 12 hour, uh, 24 hours expires. But quite often, Azure AD will tell MSOL when you get the token, hey, go ahead and start trying to refresh this token after 12 hours instead of 24. So now what will happen is uh, I have a perfectly valid token that's good for 12 more hours when this clock finally says, yep, uh, you can start refreshing the token now. If is anything wrong with Azure AD or, or any of the path between your application and getting a token from Azure AD, the network's down, what have you, uh, it doesn't matter because I can still use the token I have. Now, if there's a, an outage for an hour or two hours or three hours, your application would be unaffected because it still has a token. It's still allowed to call the other, uh, call the API um, but, uh, and then as soon as it, 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 the token flow it gets going again, it gets a new token and off you go. So we've seen applications that have these long lived tokens, uh, the, it, it, which do this proactive refresh be completely unaffected during an outage because, uh, they don't really need the, the, the token flow to work at that particular instant. And, and that can really improve the resiliency of your application. So uh, we do have some information uh, today on how you can write this code uh, at, that, at that link there in terms of how you would make your, your application uh, uh, continuous access evaluation aware. Uh, let me see if I can catch up on the questions. Uh, Harish, I know you've been answering some. Uh, do we have some open questions in the chat? Yeah, so definitely there is one uh, question in terms of uh, any idea on when these features that is CAE to be specific is going to become GA. So that's one uh, specific to the CAE discussion that we're having. Maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, so there's two, two phases there. Continuous access evaluation is in production uh, for, uh, for some Microsoft APIs and Microsoft applications. Uh, the key here is the Microsoft Graph API. Uh, that's currently in preview. I don't have an end target of when it will be generally available. Uh, but I expect it will be relatively soon uh, that we'll be able to have the Microsoft Graph API be uh, GA for continuous access evaluation. Uh, let's see, is there another open question? How does defend against a silver ticket account attack? I'm not familiar with that phrase, Lynn, so if you want to give me some more details there, that, that's fine. Uh, so I think uh, the uh, other open one I think we could uh, quickly uh, talk through is 
uh, on a client side standpoint, how what, what is the recommendation to encrypt the tokens or or, or the token cash best practices? I think if you can just summarize that in a single line on the whole, the, I think that will take care of the last question and then we'll be able to okay. go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. We should certainly. So when you're persisting these tokens, one of the reasons we don't automatically persist on every MSOL implementation is it has to be done in a secure way, a, an encrypted way, if you will. Uh, and in some platforms, it's not a given that it's built in. So, for example, on iOS and Android, it, here's exactly how you would store uh, information that is, you know, needs to be kept private. So we simply implement that in MSOL. Um, so, yes, for token caching and storage, you should definitely be encrypting those tokens wherever, excuse me, whenever you can. So I want to bring up another point, though, uh, of authorization. So we have authorization based on uh, the, just the, 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 the transmission of tokens. That sort of allows me to call an API. I also have authorization options sometimes either in the API or in my application where I need to know additional information to decide whether this user, for example, gets to use uh, particular functionality in, in the app. And I have two choices of where I get my authorization information from. One is I can get information directly from the token. And if it's a standard uh, claim today uh, or a, an optional claim, uh, say I need to know the user's IP address or I need to know the last time they authenticated or I need to know the user's uh, UPN or, or some particular element attribute about the user, I can put that information directly in the token. Uh, obviously, if I get it back in the token, it saves me needing to make another network call, so it improves my resiliency. So, for example, one of the things we certainly advise against is to use the user info endpoint. It's there it's so that we are standards compliant, but everything you find in the user info endpoint will actually be uh, in the token you have anyway. So you're just adding an extra call unnecessarily. But another area that we use, we can use tokens for is authorization based on roles and groups. So I can ask for, I can define a role for my application and I can put that role into, um, into, the, uh, into my app and, and, and users and groups can be assigned to those roles and I'll get a role claim in my token. Or I could ask to see the group membership, you know, what, member, what groups is this user a member of, et cetera. Uh, and I can get asked to see that in my, in my token. So normally this is pretty good because you end up with a new token every hour. But when you start adopting continuous access evaluation at the moment, uh, those tokens will be, will be sitting in your cache for up to a day. So now if the user changes roles in the middle of the day, uh, you might need, your, your token won't reflect that until you go ahead and get that new token. So that's something to consider today as you implement continuous access evaluation in your applications is, you know, do I have authorizations based on groups, whether it's roles or that the groups can be assigned to or groups themselves? Uh, I should consider uh, whether I should uh, continue to use my, cla my claims-based authorization because it's in the token or whether I should switch to using something like Microsoft Graph instead. Now, whenever I use group token, a uh, group uh, claims in my token, I have to implement the Microsoft Graph fallback because of the overage that can happen when I have groups in my token, right? If I have too many groups for this user and I have no idea when the, when the how many groups any particular user is in, I have to have the fallback because uh, if he's more, if I'm a member of 500 groups, I'll need Microsoft Graph to tell me which groups this user is a member of. So I kind of have to have that that implementation if I put groups in a claim anyway. Um, and it might be that given if I'm going to use uh, continuous access, access, access evaluation for that increased resiliency, then maybe I should just always use Microsoft Graph to get that group information as well. So it's something to consider as you go to adopt continuous access evaluation uh, is, you know, are, am I getting authorization things in my token? Uh, and how will that be if the token has a 24 life period to it uh, and uh, it goes stale? Now we are looking and working toward uh, creating probably a, a handling group changes in continuous access evaluation. It's on our list. I just don't have a tight date and time where that might be, uh, might be available. So Harish, can you talk to us about token validation? Absolutely, yeah. I'm going ahead and quickly sharing my screen. Please give me a minute. 
So quickly before touching about uh, the whole aspect of token validation, uh, let, let me go ahead and spend a couple of minutes on something called as metadata refresh. So Kyle mentioned about the whole uh, scenario wherein, hey, the whole authorization standpoint, there exists a piece where you need to go ahead and validate the token. And in order for you as an application developer or the application itself to validate the access token, you need to go ahead and have certain ad artifacts for it. So ultimately you need to validate the signature. And in order to do that, you need access to the signing keys. And if those signing keys are not part of the token itself, then you need to go ahead and fetch it from the open ID connect metadata document or the discovery endpoints for the identity provider. So a Microsoft identity platform does go ahead and host the metadata discovery document on an open endpoint on a pertinent basis and also from a platform specific standpoint. So ideally when you have an application that is on the client side, it's going to sign in, it's going to get a token and the client is going to go ahead and call an API. This can be a graph API. This can be custom built APIs that you're going to do and this API is going to go ahead and fetch this metadata and go ahead and cache it in its uh, memory or let's say persistent cache based on a certain logic and then going to use it to validate the tokens that it gets every single time. Now the point is in order to make sure that we don't run into uh, issues with respect to this mechanism. So yes, from a resiliency standpoint, CA is going to help you so that you don't need to go and talk to Azure AD often and we extend the lifetime so that instead of talking to Azure AD 24 times in a single day, you're, you're only going to go ahead and talk to it once and get a token and give it to the API and the API will go ahead and worry about uh, getting an event in case of a certain uh, critical change as Kyle mentioned. But then what about if let's say the, uh, there is an issue in the metadata refresh document policy itself, let's say uh, due to certain out, outage scenario, let's say uh, we have been forced to go ahead and change the signing keys on an emergency basis. Let's say, for example, uh, the application did not go ahead and handle uh, the metadata caching in a proper way, wherein we have seen certain instances that has happened in the past, wherein the whole mechanism of going ahead and fetching this did not work, and that basically caused a lot of application issues from an uptime standpoint. So that is this guidance. So. What do you do or how can you go ahead and handle is? In terms of the Microsoft identity model, the set of libraries that we have, uh, make sure that we explicitly utilize the Microsoft identity model uh, version starting seven, which has a protection wherein uh, what you see here is that, hey, in an ASP.NET Core application, when you're instantiating the authentication middleware, just make sure to go ahead and have refresh on issuer key not found set to true. Ideally, this is set to default uh, wherein the value is true, but it's better to make sure that we explicitly enable it in an ASP.NET Core application. The logic being, hey, I'm going to go ahead and get a token and I need to go ahead and validate it. Now, in order for me to validate a token, I'm going to look into the payload and I'm going to say, OK, can I go ahead and get the signing key for it? And for some reason, you're not able to reach Azure AD or let's say you're not able to go ahead and get the metadata downloaded in a proper format or your cache does not contain the key that you have. That basically causes your applications to stop working. So what we go ahead and say is if at all you're getting a token for which the key is not found in the metadata cache for your application, consider the current cache invalid. Go ahead and fetch a brand new metadata from Azure AD endpoint. So that's what this particular line item does. Similarly, from an ASP.NET or OWIN middleware standpoint, it's a hard coded value. So the OWIN middleware at this point of time, when integrated with Microsoft identity platform, that is Azure Active Directory authentication system, you are going to go ahead and set up the authority and other parameters to go ahead and set up the trust. But when you do that, the Owen middleware automatically goes ahead and gets this particular metadata on a 24 hour standpoint automatically for and perform the token validation for you. So at this point of time, the Owen middleware does not go ahead and give you any flag to go ahead and say, hey, like how ASP.NET Core gives you to refresh it when a key is not found. It is hard coded and if at all you run into a situation where the current cache is corrupted or Microsoft has forcefully cycled the keys for some reason from a security standpoint or let's say uh, some sort of an issue per se, 
you only have an option to go ahead and recycle the process or let's say force the app to restart so that you will be able to go ahead and fetch this particular key again. Now, the articles that I've mentioned here talks a bit more on what exactly this key is. Why is it used? But then primarily what we're talking about is this is an area where your app can get impacted from a resilient standpoint, and this is our guidance and just building on that. What exactly we recommend our internal uh, SDKs to do, and this is exactly what we want our external customers also to go ahead and do in this wherein. Yes, we want you to go ahead and poll for the metadata every 12 hours and use the following retry logic. Let's say if at all if there is any transient network error, go ahead and poll it once every 12 hours with a random uh, with a randomization of just one hour in it. And once that is done, make sure that once you get the JSON, when you go ahead and get the um, metadata, make sure that you pass it through a validation rules. I'll go ahead and talk about the validation rules in the next slide, but then make sure that you go ahead and validate that the JSON that you're getting is correct. And just to make sure that we are not going ahead and bombarding the system and hitting a throttling standpoint, make sure that you do this process only once in five minutes so that your application is not going ahead and trying to go ahead and hit the service continuously, if at all, just to go ahead and get rid of a transient problem. Maybe you tried it, you did not get a response because of a throttling error or something. Just wait for five minutes, just sleep for five minutes and try to go ahead and get the metadata again after that, following the same logic to go ahead and have a better success rate. So this is exactly the same mechanisms that we recommend our internal teams, our first party applications like Exchange, SharePoint, and all of those uh, Azure services to go ahead and follow and fetch it. And this is exactly the same guidance that we say, if at all, if you're using a custom mechanism in any of your applications. Again, if any of you're using our ASP.NET middleware. If you're talking about using Owen, they have their own mechanisms of handling it. But if you want to implement it, if you have any scenarios you're using it in today, this is the logic that you want to go ahead and use. And uh, finally, what is the validation rule that I talked about? Make sure that you're able to go ahead and parse the JSON. There is no corruption in the data. And if it is corrupted, if you're not able to parse the JSON format by syntax, discard it and go ahead and start the process again after five minutes and make sure that once you are able to format, identify the key endpoint. So the, the metadata format is part of the RFC. It has a specific format and there's going to be a URL that's going to say, hey, here is where all the signing keys are stored. And inside that, generally we have three keys uh, at any given point in time, at minimum two at least. So make sure you're able to find one key and store it into a cert object and make sure that it's a valid public cert. So those are the things that you can go ahead and do from your application web app slash web API end when doing manual token validation. So let's say you're an app, you're not using any of our native libraries, you are doing the heavy lifting in terms of going ahead and validating the metadata, validating the tokens and doing everything. This is a logic that can go ahead and help you minimize the downtime in terms of uh, the application when you're facing issues with the whole token validation logic. Now with this, let's directly jump onto the token validation scenario. So token validation is key in terms of the whole resiliency piece. So as I said, right, when you're talking about having an application calling an API, the first thing that we want to go ahead and say is on a client application, application that is running on a desktop, application that is running on a browser, application let's say that is running purely on a native client that is like a mobile phone, do not go ahead and perform a direct signature validation or any of that. If at all, if you want to fit some artifacts from the token, feel free to do that. Let's say you want a name and so on, absolutely cool, but then there is no additional benefit that you're going to go ahead and get when you're doing validation on a client. And why is that? I'll come to it. The actual validation, the bare minimum validation that you need to do is at the web app slash web API layer, wherein you got a request to your app. You have processed the metadata refresh logic and you have the keys, the, the discovery endpoint keys, and you've cached the valid keys by following the previous logic. Now you've gotten a token and now you need to make sure that you confirm the token is not hampered with. The token signature matches so that you know that Azure AD gave the token to the client. The client gave the exact token to me. That's the bare minimum validation that you need to do. But let's go ahead and take it a bit more further. 
So purely from an ID token standpoint, it's basically going to go ahead and tell you, hey, this is used to go ahead and identify who the user is. That's it. So on a public client, you're going to go ahead and directly talk to Azure AD, which is over HTTPS endpoint, and you're going to go ahead and get the token natively, wherein the client is directly having a line of sight with the identity provider, and hence we don't want to go ahead and perform any validation on the client. If at all, if you are talking about a web app or a service or an API that is going ahead and getting an ID token for some reason, then yes, you can perform the signature validation to this. And again, we go ahead and document all the values, payload data that we go ahead and publicize on, hey, this is the format of an ID token. And what are the values that we as Microsoft send in an ID token and an access token in this reference article? So you can go ahead and use that and take further decisions in your client app, but then no requirement of a validation and you don't need to go ahead and let's say do that and reduce one point of failure on your client applications. Have an ID token, look into it, just allow the user to sign in because you have a direct line of sight. And if at all, if any malicious actor can compromise it, he is going or he or she is going to compromise not only the token, but also the whole signing process as well. Wherein he can go ahead and intercept a brand new key for you so that he can spoof you into thinking, hey, this token is correct because it is signed by a correct key, whereas the key is malicious at that point of time. So that's the whole idea. But if at all, let's say we are talking about the confidential client, what do we want to do? So you are in a scenario where you do want to go ahead and validate an ID token, then validate the audience claim, meaning, hey, I am application A, I'm getting an ID token, validate the audience value includes the client ID of my application. So somebody is not giving me an ID token that was got for some other application. That's rule number one. Rule number two is validate the lifetime. Make sure that the token is valid from a lifetime standpoint that, hey, this is not an expired token. And finally, the nonce is a, secu is a security mechanism in terms of, let's say, where the application goes ahead and uses a specific uh, random value in terms of it when requesting a token so that we inject it into the token as well so that you can identify as an application or as an a app that hey kyle go ahead and send me this token at x or at point y with the nonce abc now if, am i getting the, the same token again with the same nonce if yes i as an application can go ahead and take uh, decisions to deny this particular token so there is guidance in terms of how you can go ahead and handle the nonce claim but that's purely at the application layer it's not that you're going to go ahead and have native token replay token theft protection. That's proof of position, but this is native capability that we have as of today as how applications can maintain a database, store the nonce values, understand that if a nonce is being repeated, maybe a token is being replayed and then you can take a call to whether deny it or approve it as an additional authorization. And Last part, uh, I know that we just have six minutes left, so that's the reason I just want to quickly go through it and have at least a couple of minutes in the end. So the last part of what we're going to go ahead and talk about today is access token. So this is the main piece of it. So this is what enables a client to go ahead and access a secure resource and Client application should not worry about an access token. It should consider it opaque. Simple reason being, as Microsoft, we can go ahead and choose to encrypt it tomorrow. And there is nothing stopping us from doing it because there isn't any exact specification like how we have in SAML payloads, uh, like, hey, an access token that is coming from an OAuth 2 compliant IDP should be in this format. There's nothing of that sort. It's just an agreement. Microsoft can go ahead and change that agreement anytime and say we are going to encrypt it and the client application will start breaking. So don't just get for an access token, consider it opaque and give it to the API. The service consuming the API will go ahead and worry about validating it. The service that is a web app or the web API will go ahead and get the metadata. It will go ahead and perform the signature validation. And after that, it is expected to go ahead and do these checks at minimum. Make sure that again, the audience is correct. Your graph API, make sure that you're getting a token with audience as graph API. If you are API A, you need to make sure that you get an access token with an audience of API A. The issuer, so this is something that is significant to uh, 
applications simply because you decide, hey, this is an app. I only want to allow my company users logging in or do I want to go ahead and allow anybody from logging in or do I have a specific list of tenants that I want to allow like company A, company B, company C. This is the value that allows you to go ahead and do that. Like you're going to go ahead and get the tenant identifier and you can go ahead and decide, hey, this is my tenant ID and hence the user is logging in from my company or my tenant and I'm going to allow them. But if you see any other value or a value that you do not trust, you can go ahead and choose to take a call saying don't allow access to the app slash API. Again, the lifetime and nonce are similar in terms of it, wherein you're going to do the same validation. And from a non standpoint, as I mentioned, you as an application developer need to have additional validation, additional storage of the nonce values to identify a token is being replayed for that to go ahead and work. Again, uh, I will go ahead and put a quick link on that in terms of uh, talking about how exactly you can implement it in our libraries and what exactly is the guidance that you as an application developer needs to follow for that. And finally, the most important aspect, look for scopes or roles. So this is an access token. You're going to go ahead and have certain uh, roles such as, hey, the user who's logging in is a simple user. The user who's logging in is an administrator. The user who's logging in is a tier one or a tier two admin, or he can have scopes like how we have scopes in graph. That is user.read, user.readwrite, and so on. So it can be our first party APIs, or it can be even your APIs that you build for which you can define scopes and read the scopes from the access token and let the user know that, OK, you have a scope of read only. I'm not going to go ahead and let you write for this particular application for this particular API. Now with that, this is, let's say, for advanced scenarios. Let's say the capability that we have in Owen where we go ahead and perform native signature validation and native audience validation and issuer validation as well. Let's say you're not uh, OK with that. You're building a multi tenant application. Then yes, you need to use the Microsoft identity model to extend the validation logic and we have a full fledged GitHub sample that we have written in an ASP.NET scenario saying, hey, if you're using ASP.NET and you're using uh, our libraries to go ahead and log in, but then you want custom validation of tokens. You're, you have a special logic. Here is a sample that we basically use this particular class to extend. We parse the token and then we go ahead and implement our validation, our custom validation. You want to go ahead and uh, enforce issuer to be value A, value B, or anything for that matter, how you go about it. So sample for ASP.NET is available in this link. We will share the deck uh, uh, along with the video and the link to the deck will be part of the description in the video. Steven will confirm that and in the Microsoft Identity Web, which is one of the latest SDKs that we have released, we have made it simpler, meaning we have added an extension wherein if you're using Identity Web and it has its own way of going ahead and saying, OK, you as a developer handle all the validation, but if you want us to help it out, you can extend a validator class and say, hey, I don't want to go ahead and write all the code that I did in JWT token handler. Rather, I'm going to say, hey, you help me out and I'll give you the list of values. I'm going to give you, uh, hey, here is the five issuers that I want to validate and here is the two audience that I want to validate and you can just give those values to this class and this class will take care of that for you. So I know that we went in a quick uh, pace at the last five minutes again, but just a quick recap. The idea is as a web app slash web API, make sure you have a resilient way of going ahead and getting the metadata. Once you get the metadata, when you're getting an access token, make sure that you're able to go ahead and validate the issuer audience. If the default validation is not enough, use custom, custom token validation. So that's the gist of it. And I'll let uh, Stephen um, go ahead and just give a close out and then we'll definitely hang out for a couple more minutes as well. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Harish, and thank you, Kyle, uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I, I really appreciate it. If you can take a few minutes to fill out the survey that I just posted in the chat window, that will be great. That will give us feedback on these calls, and also it gives an opportunity to uh, let us know what other topics you would like us to cover. Uh, so if you have any ideas for the next month's call or, or future calls, that is really welcome uh, to us. So thank you very much. The recording will be posted uh, next week. 
Uh, you can follow us in our Twitter channels that I just posted in the chat with window and we'll let you know when when those are posted so thank you have a great day everyone mm -hmm.